Hello everybody, it's uh, an honor and a pleasure for me to be here with uh, Professor Jeffrey Zai. Hi. Hello. It's uh, uh, probably the most important well, student of uh, Milton Erickson and the founder and director of the Milton H. Erickson Foundation. And uh, he holds uh, an author with um, over than 20 books written and the architect of several important conferences like the Evolution of, Con uh, of Therapy, 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 Therapy Conference, the Brief Therapy Conference, Corporate Conference, and so on. And uh, today we are here to have a brief interview about psychotherapy, about hypnotherapy, and uh, other stuff. So, Professor Zaig, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. So, um, the next year it will be the 40th anniversary since Milton Erickson's death. And so, um, what is different today for who want to study and practice the Ericksonian therapy? What we gain in these years, in these decades, and uh, what we probably lost? Yes, uh, I'm sure that we lost a lot, and that's harder to define. Milton Erickson was primarily a conceptual communicator. He didn't con communicate facts. He didn't communicate didactic information. He communicated concepts. Now, think about that for a moment. If you want to communicate a concept, could be motivation, happiness, responsibility, connection. You can't use the same methodology that you would use to communicate a fact. The world of science, the world of mathematics is designed to communicate facts and we want to be accurate and we want to have as little ambiguity as possible when we're communicating facts. In physics, force equals mass times acceleration. That's a formula. It's an equation. It's a fact. The fact of the matter is that if you sum all of the numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, unto 100, you will always get 5,050. That's a fact. It's unambiguous. But when we want to communicate a concept, that is not done in the same way. There's a different grammar. And primarily, the grammar of communicating concepts is located in the world of art. Artists do not communicate facts. Artists communicate concepts. So if you wanted to uh, feel something about the human structure and you looked at a sculpture from Modigliani, or if you looked at a sculpture from uh, Michelangelo, you, you would feel something that was conceptual, but you would not be trying to understand something factual. Now, hypnosis is conceptual communication. If you're using a hypnotic induction, you're communicating to the client, you can change your state. And out of all of the incredible experts that I have been blessed to meet, Carl Whitaker, Salvador Mnuchin, Virginia Satir, Watzlawick, um, uh, uh, Tim Beck, and Albert Ellis. Milton Erickson was the most interesting therapist in that he consistently communicated concepts. I was Erickson's student for six and a half years, intermittently for the first years, and then I moved to Phoenix to be closer to him. And out of all of the time I spent individually and in groups with Milton Erickson, he never, I think that's a slight exaggeration, he never explained facts. He never explained to me how to do a hypnotic induction. He never explained to me how to uh, do uh, the confusion technique, the interspersal technique, things that he was famous for. Erickson communicated concepts, and one of those concepts was that I could be a better Jeff Zeig, I could be more experiential in my approach. Uh, just to give you an example, when I visited Erickson, I stayed at his guest house. To say that he had a guest house sounds like he had a palace. It was really a very modest place that he lived in. I was putting away my things, and in the closet were old audio tapes of Milton Erickson doing lectures in the 1950s and 60s. And 
I asked him, could I please listen to them and put them on cassette, a more modern form, so that they would be preserved for history? And he said, of course. And the people who went to the lectures in the 50s and 60s were not psychologists because there weren't so many psychologists. They were mostly physicians, dentists, different practitioners, obstetricians, gynecologists. And Erickson started the lecture, I will, um, uh, you know, uh, exaggerate, but hypnosis. Hypnosis is something that is realized. And you can realize hypnosis because hypnosis can be realized in so many ways now. And the realization of hypnosis can help you to take ideas and bring those ideas alive and make those ideas vibrant so that they can be recognized and realized. And I'm listening to this lecture and I start to get... Uh, a little uh, off balance, and I, Dr. Erickson, I asked him, this lecture sounded like one long hypnotic induction. And he said, oh, Jeff, I, I never listened to those old lectures. I, I, I didn't teach content. I taught to motivate. Now that is, a, a, that uh, still to this day, it gives me a chill to think about that that out of all of the years that it took me to get my doctoral degree, where I had to memorize theories, research, facts, uh, techniques, and here was somebody who was teaching conceptually. So when Erickson was doing hypnosis, it was conceptual. When he was doing therapy, it was conceptual. When he was visiting with his family, it was conceptual. He was a remarkably conceptual uh, person interpersonally. In uh, his writing, he was very clear. He was very linear and he wrote beautifully. And if you want to learn what Erickson thought, read his papers and you will understand what Erickson thought. But when it came to being with people, he used hypnosis, metaphors, games, uh, symbolic assignments, directives. And these were all meant to help to elicit conceptual realizations that would alter people's state that will help people to change their identity. Okay. So that is a summary of my evolved understanding of Erickson. When I was visiting him in the 1970s, I couldn't have articulated that, but it's only as I've studied Erickson over these almost 40 years that I've been able to articulate what is essential about Erickson. Giving people experiences that will evoke conceptual realizations. Fantastic. Wow, uh, just listening to, to you to this explanation is, wow, okay, thanks. Um, <laughs> there is a thing. <laughs> Okay. I'm writing a book on it right now. I'm just finishing a book. Okay. Oh, about that? About uh, evocative communication. Evocative communication. Okay, fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, I, it's very Italian. It's very Italian. Because uh, yeah. in, in, in Italy, there are more uh, signifying gestures than in any other culture. Yeah, it's true. It's true. It's true. So. It's true. Um, well, in a recent article, you say that to elicit change, it's a matter of the therapist determining the minimal strategic step that the client is willing to take. I really love that. Uh, in brief therapy, it's very usual and very Ericksonian saying, um, bring the client to do something different, to do something right. different. Right, right. The question is how to determine that something, that minimal strategic step. I think that Ericsson say, um, observe, observe, observe. But the question for many psychologists, many psychotherapists is, yes, but observe what? Yeah, um, those are two questions that I would think about separately. So let's take the first one. Yeah. In medicine, we treat the condition. So if the person has depression, that is seen as a condition. And then you give a medicine to treat depression. If the person has anxiety, you give a different medicine. If they have a, uh, um, a, a uh, bipolar disorder, 
you give them a different medicine. So uh, in in medicine, it's very important to have a category. Mm-hmm. My what I say to my students in a social intervention: don't don't treat categories. Don't treat depression. You don't have a tool to do that. You're not a physician. You're a therapist. If you're going to do a social intervention, you need to, to look at the component structure. Yeah. Depression is a title that we give to a series of systemic components. Yeah. And those systemic components could be cognitive, behavioral, affective, perceptual, gestural, temporal, linguistic, historical, um, in terms of internal imagery, in terms of relationship patterns. And if you think about all of the different ways of communicating, uh, all of the different components of the human experience, then you can easily divide depression into its component parts. Now, for some people, just being internally absorbed is depressing. For some people, uh, uh, living in an unchangeable past, being locked into the unchangeable past, that's depressing. For other people, being disengaged from others is depressing. So we don't know what any particular person needs in terms of the number of systemic components that will lead that person to say, I'm depressed. Yeah. So an easy way to do that is to ask the patient to teach the therapist how to be depressed. You know, tell me what to do. I'd like to know because sometimes I have patients who don't know how to be depressed. And although you might not believe it, that's really a terrible problem because depression, some degree of depression is normal. It's like deep rest. And we need that. We need a working depression when we are confronted with some of the challenges of life. So please teach me. Teach me how to be depressed. And what do you do cognitively? What do you do behaviorally? And sometimes with a patient, I'm just listening to the patient. And uh, I try to make a chart in my mind or sometimes on paper of what are the components and what are the primary components. Now, if you know the primary components, like somebody's depression is uh, a continuous negative dialogue, mm-hmm. this nothing is going to change, this is going to be horrible, I can't do anything about it. If we know that the client is doing that, probably I wouldn't intervene okay. in that area. Okay. I would choose something more peripheral. Like, could you make a change in the way in which the person perceives the world, that the person notices the colors that are apparent outside in a more vibrant way? So taking a small step is to find a peripheral component of the systemic uh, aspect of the problem and work from the periphery in. It's the way that a doctor would palpate an appendix. If the doctor was palpating, they'd start from the outside and work their way in. And don't go to the area where there's the most entrenched resistance, but make a change in a peripheral area. Now, goals in psychotherapy are not like goals in medicine. In medicine, if a patient has a bacterial infection, and goes to 10 different doctors, 10 different doctors are going to say, you have a bacterial infection, you need an antibiotic. But if a person with depression goes to 10 different therapists, one is going to say, you need to change your cognitions. The other is going to say, you need to change your relationship patterns. You need to change your understanding of history. You need to change your posture. You need to change your diet. So uh, every therapist is going to come at the problem from a different road, and that's okay. So because uh, uh, therapy can be a very idiosyncratic enterprise, and what I would do with a depressed patient, Flavio, would be very different from what you would do, Flavio, and we could both be very successful coming at something from different angles because there's not one way of treating depression or anxiety or bad relationship as in medicine there is a much more algorithmic formulaic way of treating problems 
So we need to understand that being integrative, I don't even call myself an Ericksonian therapist, I call myself an integrative experiential psychotherapist, because to me, whatever works, and if I need to make transference interpretations or help people to change their negative cognitions or have people speaking to an empty chair, I I do whatever works. I'm not um, religious about my uh, theory. I am a little bit more religious about my practice because as I develop as a therapist, I'm increasingly evocative, increasingly experiential. Goals basically are a, um, um, a, a um, interaction between the position of the therapist and the orientation of the client. So sometimes the client knows the exact goal, sometimes the therapist has a better understanding, but goals are negotiable. There's not one right goal for any particular problem in psychotherapy. So you try a goal, and if that doesn't work, feel free to change the goal. Um, You know, if you say to somebody that your depression is anger turned inward, and they don't change, and you say, okay, well, your, your depression is disturbed cognitions, or your depression is existential anxiety, if you, you can define a problem in many different ways, individually, in terms of two people, in terms of a family, in terms of the way in which the family interacts with an institution, in terms of the way the institution acts, interacts with the culture. There's no one right way to define a psychological problem. You can call it trauma or not, and uh, every therapist has uh, a... Um, a style and that style needs to be honored and developed and uh, every therapist will have ways that are different of working with the depression or anxiety it's not medicine it's a social intervention it, it feels um, uh, you know my, my, my next question um, should be about philosophy because um, in a video of yours of your um, five minute therapy tips that are great and I suggest for every psychologist and psychotherapist to uh, see those videos you talk about philosophy and um, it's something about um, what you just just say in this moment because um, I think that philosophy um, the idea of change behind the therapy's action is one of the most important things for effective and brief change, you know? Yes. Um, so this is the, um, the right philosophy for Jeffrey Zai to approach therapy, it is this. Yes. You know, f- so first of all, psychotherapy developed from philosophy. And uh, really, <laughs> the ideas of philosophers eventually evolved into uh, ideas that could be researched in psychology, mm-hmm. and eventually <laughs> ideas that were used by Freud to invent psychotherapy in 1885, when Freud first became interested in the psychological aspects of, the me- of medicine. You know, my philosophy, as I uh, develop, I've been doing therapy for 45 years as a counselor, uh, and before that as a, as a paraprofessional, but as a, as a licensed professional for 45 years. And my philosophy is an exaggeration. My belief is, is that the state of the therapist is the progenitor of the technique. So most students learn techniques, Mm -hmm. like, you know, Giorgio Nardoni is a good friend and he's a brilliant tactician and uh, he could give you a technique for working with an obsessive compulsive patient and it would work. But my philosophy is that the state of the therapist is the progenitor of the technique. You can start therapy from the perspective of theory, of research, of technique. Mm -hmm. But I uh, uh, take a very radical perspective and I say the state of the therapist is the most important. Erickson contributed more than 300 cases to the literature and we still find new ones. 
Now, Erickson did this because he was in a utilization state, and that was one of the states that Erickson occupied. And utilization is a state of response readiness, ready to respond constructively to what's ever offered and whatever exists in the context. And all of Erickson's 300 cases are based in utilization. Now, we could say that Erickson was a tactician and that he was thinking strategically about all of the moves that he was making. And some of that is true. He was in a strategic state and not necessarily thinking about all of the steps, but he was in a state of being strategic. He was in the state of being evocative. He was in the state of um, uh, being multiple level in his communication, recognizing that the informative and the evocative levels of communication could both be utilized effectively to promote change. So what I, when I write about Erickson, I write about the states that he inhabited and that the technique that he used evolved from the state. So a friend of mine in the 1970s was visiting uh, Erickson and uh, he had a case of a couple and the wife had scoliosis, she had a curved spine. Mm -hmm. And the therapist and the wife thought that the husband's sexual avoidance was due to the scoliosis. The husband said no. And uh, the therapist still believed that the scoliosis uh, was a, an important factor in the husband's sexual avoidance and asked Erickson for a consultation. And Erickson said, well, I would take the woman aside. I would take the men, men aside. I would talk to them. I would give them a new orientation. I would say to them, men love curves. Men are designed to love curves. Men are enculturated to love curves. And I would begin to give him a new orientation. Now, you can't come to a sentence like that so quickly unless you're in a utilization state, ready to utilize whatever you're given constructively. And Erickson called in himself a utilization state. And I've known this for 45 years and I'm still working on it, that there's no problems. There are only challenges to utilize. And once you can get into that state, then being strategic, being multiple level, being experiential, all of these things amalgamate together into a robust form of being a therapist. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, it, it's funny because you, um, you are anticipating my questions because I, um, mm -hmm. I would like to... Um, to ask you a, a suggestion, you know, there is um, this book, uh, Experience um, Ericsson, this is the Italian uh, translator, he has a very good book, still a very good book, um, in, in which there is uh, what I call the observing task that Ericsson suggests to you to improve your skill. Sure. It's very interesting, uh, I suggest to every psychologist to read this book and other books about Milton Ericsson. And, um, I, honestly, I do it very often since I read this book, and it seems to me that fits with the deliberate practice uh, that is a, an idea that is spreading around since a while. So um, I would like to ask you um, uh, to suggest to the therapist um, some, some idea um, to improve uh, as a professional. Probably uh, an idea could be how to be in, in that kind of state. Of course. Yeah, in, Erickson was in an acuity state. It was one of the states that he inhabited. Mm -hmm. It was as if he would just turn on his gaze. And when I visited Erickson, I was a more internally preoccupied person. Mm -hmm. And I could have been a Jungian therapist yes. because I was interested. I wasn't I didn't learn, I didn't come from a lineage of people, my father, my grandfather, who were especially observant. Mm -hmm. So Erickson recognized a weakness in me and he gave me tasks that would help me to develop an inferior function. Yeah. He would say, go to a schoolyard, watch children predict which child will speak first, which child will play with what toy, which child will leave the group first. And he would give me challenges 
Um, you're a man is walking towards you. He's wearing street clothes. He's a policeman. How do you know? Now, Erickson was a massively visually perceptive person. But if you spent a year being paralyzed, you would probably, which he did when he was 17, 18 and recovering from polio, you would be uh, more visually as perceptive, too. He had, didn't have anything else to do other than be perceptive auditorily and, and visually. It's not that this is a necessity. You know, people like Steve DeShazer and Albert Ellis weren't especially visually perceptive and they were brilliant therapists. People like Fritz Perls were extraordinarily visually perceptive and that was a mainstay of their therapy. But um, I have a book coming out very soon by Franco Angeli which is my book on hypnotic induction, which will be in Italian. Okay. And for those of you who read English, there's another book that I wrote called Psycho Aerobics. It's about therapist development. Yeah. And the largest category of experiential exercises is about acuity, okay. because acuity could be divided into a dozen different components. You know, there is acuity to detail, there's acuity to pattern, there's acuity to things that are conspicuously absent. There is a, 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 a acuity to uh, interactional effects. There's not one uh, observational skill. So just like I would divide depression into a series of components, I would divide acuity into components. Mm -hmm. And I will, in the, this book, Psychoaerobics, which is available from ericsson-foundation.org. Mm -hmm. In that book, I have a series of exercises that address all of the different components of being perceptive. Oh, cool. um, visual concentration, visual attention, visual detail. And you can't just uh, say observe and stay with that as a concept, observe how, what, when. And um, Erickson's observational skills were remarkable. And he, what he did was he often practiced inference, which was another skill set of, of, of acuity. When, X, then, Y. Yeah. So uh, a woman who I saw who had been a patient of Erickson's became a patient of mine. And I said to him, in, to her, what was the experience with Erickson? And she said, well, in the first session, Erickson said to me, you were not your mother's favorite, but you were your grandmother's favorite, probably your maternal grandmother. And he was right. And that, that was unforgettable to her uh, two decades after she saw Erickson, she still remembered that moment. Now, it's possible that Erickson's inferences were wrong some of the time, yeah. but they wouldn't have been remembered. So one of the skill sets that I don't have is inference. So um, I would go into a restaurant, I would hear the waitress in the United States say something, and I would say, you were born in the south of the United States, probably Georgia. And I would try to make an inference based on a slight accent that I heard. And uh, I, you know, would say to somebody uh, in, a, in a grocery store, you're not uh, an oldest child, you were probably yo a youngest child. Yeah. And this is deliberate practice in an unrelated field where I'm practicing inference because this was a skill set that Erickson was very strong at, that I'm weak at. And so if I keep on exercising those muscles, then I could uh, develop a more in my procedural memory, uh, a more rapid way of making inference. So uh, people would need to decide what fragment of observe is it necessary for them to develop? What are they good at? Where are their or weaknesses? Like some people have strong biceps, but weak triceps, then you exercise your triceps more. So you, you, you uh, have to 
make uh, a, um, a, a careful study of the components of observation. And yes, Erickson, you know, was, you know, amazing at observation. I interviewed one of his son-in-laws. They were driving through the street and uh, Erickson said, drive around the block. So they drove around the block. And Erickson said, that woman standing there is a man. Yeah. Now, he, he uh, recognized something that he saw the first time about the way in which that person was moving. And uh, so it's, it's almost, and, and Erickson would say, quite frankly, that he loved to go to the airport early and Mrs. Erickson didn't. So he would go to the airport early just to watch people. Yeah. And, uh, and he was consistently observing. And um, that made him an outsider because Erickson wasn't the kind of person that you could talk with about politics. He was consistently evocative and, existent, and consistently conceptual and fascinated with what he could learn and loved to observe and um, understand what it was that he was observing. You know, if he saw this, the person might have had this history. If he saw this, the person might have this future. And he said that he took, when he was in graduate school, he really didn't have training in psychiatry from many experts. He had to invent himself as a psychiatrist. It was the end of World War I. There wasn't many psychiatrists when he was in medical school. So um, Erickson um, uh, would get a social history from the social work service and he would write out a mental status examination. Then he would do the real me mental status examination and compare it with his intuited mental status examination. Then he would do the opposite. He would take a mental status examination and write social history, and then he would compare that to the real social. Now, Erickson, Erickson really wanted to be the world's great psychotherapeutic communicator, and in my estimation, he accomplished that. But he worked diligently, and he worked slavishly in the same way that a, a great um, soccer player, a great tennis player would have to practice religiously to be at the very top of the game. And Erickson was always practicing. If you, uh, and I never did go out to dinner with him, but if you would have gone out to dinner with him, he would have been practicing. Could he get you to turn the salt shaker around 360 degrees without you realizing what that that he you were responding to one of his suggestions and then he would delight in the way that you would learn something about implicit responsiveness okay. so he was always on and uh, uh, i you know don't like to I, can't, I don't have that concentration i can't uh, uh, concentrate that intently for that long a period of time there was a story about erickson being at a social reception with margaret mead and this, they had a receiving line. So the hostess was greeting all of the guests who lined up to greet her. And Erickson, and Margaret Mead was behind Erickson, and Erickson smiles. He's very warm in his tone of voice. He's looking at her intently, and he's shaking her hand. And he says, you know, those horses' tails that we had for hors d'oeuvres were absolutely wonderful. I hope that I can get the recipe. And she says, thank you very much, and walks off. Now, of course, nobody serves horses' tails. And Erickson wanted to demonstrate to Margaret Mead that the content of the communication is not necessarily important, that the way in which you offer the communication uh, may be most important. And if you follow the rules of society that uh, were um, in that particular situation, the person might not even hear the content, which the hostess didn't. And Erickson was experimenting, and he was uh, trying to demonstrate something and learn something about human behavior. So he was consistently establishing experiments for himself, and he loved it. And I 
Um, I don't have that mentality. I'm glad he did, but it's not my style. Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. Reading your books, I, I think that you have a great mentality you, you can teach us a, a lot of things, but I, I know what you mean. Um, so, uh, just a last question, Professor Zai. Um, among the various things, as I said, you are the main organizer of the Brief Therapy Conference and the evolution of psychotherapy. That are two of the most um, important worldwide events in the field of psychotherapy. So, um, can you tell us what you think are some important uh, future trends and topics of interest and or challenges for the therapist in, in the future? Sure. Well, when we look back at the evolution of psychotherapy, which started in Europe, where the tradition was more conservative and the interest was why, why are people the way that they are? And after World War II, when you couldn't have psychotherapy, because in order to have psychotherapy, you have to have a, a culture that is not based in scarcity. If you're concerned with food and shelter, you're not going to be concerned about your neuroses. So as therapy developed more quickly in the United States after World War II with a more pragmatic American influence. It's not so important why, it's more important how. And you had the development of behaviorism and you didn't need to understand why the person had the problem in order for the person to change. You could just use behavioral techniques and then you had the development of a humanistic approach to psychotherapy where you just appreciate and be with the person and establish an I-thou relationship. And then you had the um, development of cognitive behavioral uh, methods of psychotherapy and the development of systemic orientations to psychotherapy. Don't treat individuals, treat the system. Change can happen when you make an alteration in the system. And then to me, Erickson represented another stream, this experiential stream of psychotherapy. And now what is in vogue is affective neurobiology. And people like Ernest Rossi and uh, Daniel Siegel, uh, Daniel Amen have brought the brain into focus. And this is the decade, or could be the century of the brain, where we're all trying to understand um, how the organ that we treat, which is the brain, how does that organ operate? Mm. And uh, we've made marvelous strides in understanding. Now, when I started the Evolution Conference in 1985, it was like Star Wars. My theory, my technique is better than yours. And a lot of the people who I invited didn't know each other. In my suite in the faculty meeting prior to the conference, I watched a 78-year-old Joseph Wolpe walked over to 83-year-old Carl Rogers and they said to each other, we've never met. Mm -hmm. So you had the titular leader of behavior therapy and the titular leader of humanistic therapy and they never met. So my conferences have inched psychotherapy into the direction of technical integration. You can have whatever theory you want to have and if that serves your purposes, great. But the techniques of doing therapy, um, we can integrate. And now in the evolution conferences, it's become much more of a collaborative approach. What are some of the commonalities that make therapy work? Oh, you're doing that on your side of the fence? I'm doing something similar on my side of the fence. So the evolution conferences, I hope, have taken uh, my field and moved it into uh, a different and moved it into a more integrative approach. Now, in the United States, which is different from every other country, um, where where psychotherapy is paid for by insurance, that doesn't happen in Italy. Mm -hmm. So there is a necessity for doing treatments that are empirically validated, which to me is a regressive movement in psychotherapy, not an advance because then basically therapists become techni technicians. Mm -hmm. Just tell me right, the right technique and tell me the technique that's empirically validated and I'll do it. Now, people like Scott Miller, where you have feedback informed therapy. Yeah. So you use the empirical data, the feedback that you get from the client 
to calibrate and to target the therapy in a better way. And uh, that type of research, I think, uh, I hope, will come more to the forefront and uh, rather, uh, and uh, we, we won't be looking at effect sizes that are so small, but then taken as gospel uh, at that this is the proper way to treat a social phobia. You use this protocol and that's all there is to it. And that ha- has become increasingly the case in the United States where psychotherapy is more insurance driven. So I'm hoping that Right now, I travel to more than 40 countries to lecture about psychotherapy. That might be the Guinness Book of Records. And, uh, um, you know, that that's uh, uh, a large portion of the number of countries on Earth. And all of, the, all of those countries are, are developed. I don't go to um, non-developed countries because psychotherapy um, uh, is not, psychotherapists are not so predominant, nor do they make enough money to afford having lecturers come uh, from the United States. But I hope that psychotherapy, like Buddhism, will take on a cultural cast. Uh, a, A statue of a Thai Buddha looks Thai, a statue of a Japanese Buddha looks Japanese, and the um, the cast that Buddhism took was different from Christianity, which was much more doctrinaire. This is the doctrine, but in places like Brazil, they're synchronistic, and they have found ways of incorporating, for example, African spiritism with uh, the Catholic culture. Um, so I'm hoping that um, as psychotherapy develops in other countries, uh, um, China is an example uh, that it will have roots, it will have new perspectives that develop the field because uh, truthfully I haven't heard so many new ideas in the last 30 years about psychotherapy. Um, uh, I so think that the field had its expansion, it di- grow, grew divergently very quickly in especially the 70s and the 1980s And now it's kind of a a cooling and more of a search for commonalities. But um, I I hope that there are people who bring new ideas and uh, new perspectives that are fundamental to psychotherapy. I'm not talking about working with advanced conditions that are rare, but new ideas that are really fundamental. And I hope that Um, I can do that with some of my work and talk about some fundamental processes that can be used uh, no matter if the person is um, a psychoanalyst or they're a behavior therapist or a systemic therapist, that some of the perspectives that I talk about can be um, useful in no matter what the level of the therapist and no matter what the technique. The uh, books that I would like to mention is a, a trilogy I wrote the first book, Hypnotic Induction, which will be in Spanish, uh, in in Italian, it's already in Spanish. And uh, I wrote uh, another book on psychoaerobics, which is Exercises for Therapist Development. And then I wrote another book called Anatomy of an Intervention, which was published early this year. And that is my model of brief therapy. And then the next book will be on evocative approaches to psychotherapy. I hope that'll be out by the end of the year or perhaps by early next year. Um, And so uh, I'm trying to uh, make available things at the Erickson Foundation where we also have the largest archive that you can imagine of uh, psychotherapy from video recorded from 1984 to the present day. And now we're at a project of streaming videos. At the end of this year, we do the Brief Therapy Conference in San Francisco. Next year, we do the Erickson Congress in Phoenix. In 2020, we do the Evolution of Psychotherapy Conference again. So we have lots of things that are still developing, and people can go to erickson-foundation.org and learn. You can also, as you said, go to YouTube, and if you, you can find a lot of my lectures, and you can find the series Five Minute Tips for Therapists, We're in our second season, concluding our second season of the five-minute tips for therapists. There's about 35 of them. Great. So thank you, Flavio. I really appreciate 
Yeah. Thank you, Professor Schultz. I, I really appreciate your time. Yeah. And your and answers and. Uh, and yeah, and see you in December. You'll be presenting at the Brief Therapy Conference. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for giving that space. It will be a great honor. Thank you. That's, that's super. See you in December. and uh, I really See you in December. For your books and maybe other events uh, also in Italy. Okay. Ciao, ciao. Ciao. Thank you. Thanks.